Over the last 20 years, I've been a television and radio reporter in the Pacific Northwest. And during that period of time, I have passed along to the public hundreds of news stories from all portions of the world about the UFOs, the unidentified flying objects, the flying saucers. I have seen UFOs. But in all of those news stories, I've detected one missing fact, one incredible, glaring omission. Not one world public agency or scientific group has even offered a partial solution to this most amazing mystery of all time. No public authority has told us who are the overlords of the UFO, and why are they here, right now, at this time? There is no Air Force defending any portion of this planet that can truthfully deny that the following documented incidents did take place and that similar incidents are taking place almost every day somewhere in the world. In the southeastern United States, military aircraft have disappeared and UFOs have been connected with those disappearances. Near Pascagoula, Mississippi, two shipyard workers were taken aboard a UFO and given physical examinations. In 1976, in Kentucky, three women were taken aboard a UFO and terrorized while the humanoid Truman of the UFO gave them physical examinations. In Wyoming, in 1975, an oil exploration foreman while elk hunting was picked up by a UFO along with the elk and was medically examined and returned to the elk hunting area by the UFO crewman. In Arizona, in 1975, while working in open country, Travis Walton was zapped away for five days and kept aboard a UFO. A few weeks previously, near Alamogordo, New Mexico, a member of the U.S. military was examined by the humanoid crewman of a UFO. Rather than reveal that fact, the U.S. military found duty for Staff Sergeant Charles L. Moody in Western Europe. Before the kidnappers of the UFO, humans seem helpless. The largest circulation newspaper in the United States offers a million dollar reward for decisive UFO information. According to UFO contactees, this is what a UFO humanoid crewman looks like. This is the best UFO photograph in the world. The military took it years ago and kept it secret. NASA reveals its UFO policy. NASA astronauts have seen UFOs. You learn for the first time what the Air Force Academy teaches its cadet officers about the reality of the UFO. You learn UFO fact, not science fiction. In a surprise ending, you'll see the answers to this incredible worldwide UFO mystery. The origin of the alien intelligences who are the overlords of the UFO. You know, Captain, I keep thinking about a real problem, and it's bugging me. What's that? Well, remember the uh, TWA case when uh, Captain Schemmel dived under a UFO and about a dozen passengers got hurt? Boy, I sure do, yeah. Ever think of what that would be like on a 747? Well, I've, I've thought about it, but I don't talk about it too much. Well, we got three or four hundred passengers and 20 stews moved around the cabin. Most of the passengers don't keep their seat belts fastened. Now, if a big UFO came on a collision course, and with a 747 cruising at over 600 miles an hour, we'd have just a couple of seconds to take an evasive action of some sort, a, a dive or a zoom. 300 people would be smashed around and a lot of them hurt. Some could be even killed. You couldn't tell what would happen in that cabin. Probably panic. Well, panic at the least, but... You know, even if you got control and got down okay, the airlines couldn't hide a thing like that. But the FAA doesn't want to hear about UFOs. And they don't tell us, that's for sure. Now, if we talk about UFOs to the news media, we somehow get blacklisted and our jobs are in jeopardy. As an airlines pilot, no matter how many UFOs I see in the air, I'm not telling anybody about it.
In the last half of this century, there has been one mind-boggling giant of a mystery, which has overridden the knowledge gathered by mankind through the ages. There seems to be no answer to the reason for the appearances of the unidentified flying objects, the UFOs. Public opinion pollster George Gallup reports that perhaps 15 million U.S. citizens, scientists, and other responsible observers have seen the so-called flying saucers, the UFOs. Who are the overlords of the UFO? What is their origin and their mission? On July 31st, 1952, in the Italian Alps, north of Milan, engineer Gian Pietro Mongusi took these pictures of the landing of a UFO on the rough ice of the Churchin Glacier. The UFO landing was only three minutes in duration. A humanoid in some kind of space suit with equipment on his back, emerged from the UFO, walked part way around it, and then re-entered. And Mongoosey had the pictures to prove it. Verification of the origin of these photographs was made for the producers of this motion picture by a Swiss researcher and niece of psychiatrist Dr. Carl Gustav Jung, Miss Lou Zinstag. Since that time, world newspapers have made note of UFO stories in all degrees, from casual mention to news of an all-out UFO invasion. The mental health of UFO observers was questioned. From 1951, another photograph of a UFO from Riverside, California, showing the very significant bell-shaped configuration with three spheres projecting from its underside. This is the most familiar type of UFO and has been seen and photographed worldwide by UFO researchers. Who are the alien intelligences behind this type of space travel device? Are the UFOs friend or foe? In 1973, another significant UFO picture shows not only the anti-gravity device operational, but also with it is a smaller degravitated sphere under the control of the alien intelligences of the UFO. Who are the overlords of the UFO? In the Mediterranean, on a Sicilian beach, two small UFOs in the act of materialization from another dimension are observed by excited local citizens. Materialization, a concept far beyond the understanding of modern science, but used by the alien intelligences of the UFO. A PhD in biochemistry on the faculty of the University of Oregon in Eugene, took this picture of a UFO in the act of materialization from another dimension. Three times during the shutter snap interval, the UFO appeared and disappeared, and here is the evidence. The scientist, fearful of the scorn of his fellows, kept his name secret. He had no desire to investigate one of the most incredible events of the science of the coming 21st century to which he had been witness and to which he had photographic evidence. Kidnappings have occurred of military jets, people and automobiles full of people. The military is helpless and so are the police departments of the world. Where is the origin of the UFOs? UFO Quebec carried this sketch of a UFO humanoid crewman with a map of the star system in the vicinity of Zeta Reticuli, many light years away. 
This was indicated to UFO contactees Betty and Barney Hill. Is it truth or is it a cover-up story? Two UFOs over San Francisco, similar to UFO surveillance stories and photographs to come from every major city in the world. Iron Curtain scientists have stated publicly their feeling not only that UFOs are real, but that they have the same type of experiences which match those published in the Western world. We now reveal the facts of the UFO which couldn't be kept secret. The planet's most incredible unsolved mystery. Despite the cover-up efforts of world governments, a world silence, silenced by fear, and a helpless world military, private scientific investigators all over the planet have contributed the UFO evidence which we now reveal. The UFO, the secret that couldn't be kept, that can no longer be covered up. Mount Rainier in the state of Washington was the area where private pilot businessman Ken Arnold, flying back to his Idaho home, first saw nine disc-like flying objects on the sunny afternoon of 24 June, 1947. They were moving at 1,500 miles an hour, a speed far exceeding anything we could put into the air at the time. When he landed his airplane at Pendleton, Oregon, he reported the sighting of inverted saucers moving at incredible speed. The next day on the radio news broadcasts, and in the newspapers, the story sensationalized the term flying saucers. The previous summer of 1946, a member of the U.S. military encountered a giant UFO in a near-miss aerial situation, and the Air Force kept the threat to air safety secret. This event happened on the first day of August, 1946, to the man second in charge of flight safety, for the U.S. Tactical Air Command, Captain Jack E. Puckett. Captain Puckett's UFO encounter occurred about 30 miles from MacDill Air Force Base near Tampa, Florida, where his twin-engine C-47 airplane nearly collided with an airborne object about twice the size of a B-29 bomber or about 300 feet long. His report further described the UFO as being cigar-shaped or cylindrical and with what appeared to be glowing portholes. Governmental agencies have not responded to anxious questions from UFO observers. The Federal Aviation Administration has no UFO policy or opinion. The U.S. Air Force says it has aborted its UFO study program. No answer has been publicly given. UFOs still continue to be sighted worldwide. At the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, the cadets in training will become the officers who will police our airspace for the next crucial decade. While in the air, in the most complex airborne machines that our engineering science can design, they will encounter the far more sophisticated UFO, which worldwide research has now shown can disable the most reliable electrical and electronic systems of an airplane. The course of instruction at the U.S. Air Force Academy must contain some reliable information concerning the reality of the UFO. Of all government agencies questioned, the most responsive answer to that question has come from the Department of Physics at the Air Force Academy in a letter from its former director, Colonel Anthony J. Maione, who says in part, In this text, an expanded section on UFOs and extraterrestrial life is included. The section attempts to provide a hopefully unbiased summary of UFO information and concludes the best thing to do is to keep an open and skeptical mind and not take an extreme position on any side of the question. To further expand on the background we hope our graduates will have, we invited and had Dr. Stanton Friedman visit with us last April. During his visit, he presented two large audience lectures and two seminars, essentially in support of his subject, Flying Saucers Are Real. 
I hope you gather that we do make a continuing and real effort to provide our students with all views of current topics. They are expected to come to their own mature conclusions based upon the broadest foundation of knowledge and information that we can provide. Yours truly, Anthony J. Maione, Colonel, United States Air Force, Professor and Head of the Department of Physics. He tells of the text, Introductory Space Science, and reveals exactly what the cadets at the Academy are being taught about UFOs today. These are the men who will have to make crucial decisions while in the air when they encounter the incredible UFO. In the past, officers of the Air Forces of the world were given no instruction or any preparation whatsoever for this mind-chilling experience when they meet the spacecraft of the overlords of the UFO face to face. Nor have our astronauts been given proper instruction. From Introductory Space Science, Volume 2, page 466. We should not deny the possibility of alien control of UFOs on the basis of preconceived notions not established as related to the UFO. Our physics may not apply. From available information, the UFO phenomenon appears to have been global in nature for almost 50,000 years. Known witnesses have been reliable people. This leaves us with the possibility of alien-controlled UFOs by visitors to this planet from this solar system or other solar systems. The existence of at least three or possibly four different groups of aliens, possibly at different stages of development, which implies the existence of intelligent life on the planets in our solar system or a surprisingly strong interest in Earth by members of other solar systems, the Air Force Academy text admonishes its officers in training to keep an open mind on the baffling subject of unidentified flying objects. Maybe it's the honeymoon capital, this corner of the galaxy. Maybe the, the lecturers selected by the U.S. Air Force Academy to establish for their officers in training that flying saucers are real was Stanton Friedman. It could be mining engineers. He had been appearing on the lecture circuit in various U.S. colleges as a UFO analyst with a high level of scientific training. Friedman's academic background includes a bachelor's and master's degree in nuclear physics from the University of Chicago. His employment background included much high-level work in space science in the area of fusion rocket research and nuclear-powered aircraft. He was 14 years with such aerospace contractors as TRW Systems, Westinghouse, and General Electric. He says... UFOs are the most challenging scientific problem of this or any other age. He made the following statements in public in Seattle, Washington, the home of one of the world's largest aerospace manufacturers, Boeing. The government has never really said what it's been credited as saying, that there are no flying sounds. They really word their press releases very carefully. The press takes it that last step. Uh, I think every government in the world has three major problems along these lines with regard to UFOs. One, they'd like themselves to figure out how it works, because it makes a great weapons delivery system. It makes anything worth flying look pretty naive by comparison. Two, you'd want to make sure that the other guy doesn't figure out how to duplicate their behavior, because then you have a defense problem. If he's got something that flies like these things, we got a problem, because we can't handle it. And three, perhaps most important, a kind of philosophical, political problem, as soon as it becomes obvious to the people on the planet and widely accepted that flying saucers are real and from off the earth, there's going to be a push for a view of man as earthlings. The people on this planet, instead of I'm an American or Russian or Chinese, I'm an earthling. There is no government that wants its citizens to owe their primary allegiance to the planet as opposed to the country. Nobody wants to give up their power. And you know, all these jokes about taking it to your leader, that's wishful thinking. What's funny about those is that there is no leader to be taken to. There's nobody who speaks for planet Earth. So there are enormous political problems with anybody saying, yes, there's somebody out there and he's coming here and he doesn't want to talk to me as a representative of the planet. 
Who do we, how do we choose who speaks for the planet? I don't know. Since the 1950s, it has been easy to point to the millions of suns in space and speculate that somewhere out there is the home of the UFO. That UFOs are spacecraft from some other Earth, orbiting some other sun, just like ours. From a visible sun in the visible universe. Perhaps so, perhaps not. But the UFOs could also be from an invisible dimension in the invisible portion of the universe, which our science cannot easily detect. Perhaps one or possibly both of these concepts will one day be the explanation of the origin of the UFO. The Air Force Academy text on space science concedes that two three or even four levels of alien intelligences might be involved. NASA at the Johnson Space Flight Center near Houston, Texas, only concerns itself with the visible universe, with aerospace contracts administering the manufacturing of visible metal vehicles, making visibly televised trips in the Earth-Moon area and with probes within the solar system by unmanned devices. NASA astronauts in their Skylab make a track across the nighttime sky, lit by millions of suns. The activities of the astronauts are minutely planned and carried out, but the framework is that of Earth science as we understand and engineer its application. There seems little room for productive scientific speculation, perhaps because of the $38 billion NASA space budget, which is highly criticized in many quarters. It is difficult to explain why the planners of NASA's space program would refuse to admit the spacecraft capabilities of the alien intelligences who built this device first seen over the Korean battle area in 1952 and photographed by the U.S. military. This picture was available to NASA. Obviously, it is not a picture of anything manufactured by humans on this Earth. It was classified then and now as an unidentified flying object a UFO. Can we now identify it? Is this actual photographic evidence that proves that alien intelligences use a spacecraft like this to travel from their dimension to our reality? Is a Watergate-type scientific cover-up involved? Let's now examine that possibility. NASA first had warnings of UFOs from the pilots of its own X-15 project. The X-15 is a rocket-powered airplane which is launched high over the desert test area in California. The B-29 bomber is the launch vehicle which takes off, flies to its highest possible altitude, and then launches the little rocket-powered airplane. The test pilot gives it power, and the airplane goes through its maneuvers. Various complex engineering problems are worked out by such testing. And the engineering flight test pilot is one busy man. But on May 30th, 1962, Test pilot Joe Walton photographed five disc-like objects from the X-15 rocket test airplane. The UFOs were very similar to the disc-like objects seen over Mount Rainier 15 years earlier by Ken Arnold. NASA made no public mention of what the discs were, their origin, or any scientific speculation whatsoever about this observance of their X-15 project 
by intelligences of the UFO. On July 17th of that same year, this time at an altitude of about 58 miles, test pilot Bob White noted that he had UFO company and photographed unexplained objects even closer to his X-15. Across the nation, news headlines state that 26 astronauts have seen and photographed UFOs. The public is puzzled by NASA's silence on the subject. The producers of this motion picture were answered on two occasions by high public affairs administrators of NASA, who stated, It's not in our charter to investigate the UFO. Inside the Skylab in zero gravity, the astronauts go through the day and night with their every minute carefully scheduled. The scientific experiments are in almost every instance planned, not to open new areas of the unknown in cosmic science, but to reinforce the ideas we already hold regarding the reality of the universe. Planners have left no time or leeway in which the UFO can be postulated, thought about, or examined. Certainly, few startling public announcements have been made of any new discoveries during space missions. No new theories have been advanced. Astronaut Jack Lausma in Skylab 3 saw a glowing red object making its way across the field of his vision. He photographed it from his little planetoid in space, the NASA Skylab. It could have been explained as a meteor glowing red in space, except that there is no atmosphere in space whose friction could heat a meteor to a red glow. Was it a UFO observing Skylab? NASA remains silent. Complex instrument packages such as Explorer 10 vanish in space. Launched on the 25th of March, 1961, it disappeared, although its life expectancy was over 100 years. Perhaps some alien intelligence is examining this complex NASA space device. NORAD cannot find it, and it is not transmitting. It just disappeared. What is the photographic evidence that UFOs are watching our every space move? Why is it so hard for the project managers of NASA to accept the reality of the UFO? Is there a high-level scientific cover-up? And if so, why? Governments are charged with upholding the law, and no law on Earth is more basic than the law of gravity. No wonder the obvious anti-gravity capability of the UFO makes governments uncomfortable. Bravely, some astronauts have stated that they believe in the reality of the UFO and the capability of the UFO to defy gravity while our giant rockets consume enormous amounts of fuel, putting a simple space capsule or Skylab in orbit. In the dark blue of space, in silence orbiting the Earth, the Skylab is the planetoid home of its crew. The crew is like the NASA test pilots in the X-15, busily occupied and concerned with the scientific work outlined for them by their NASA masters. Life support in Earth orbit is a scientific victory in itself and a major achievement for Earthlings. But outside alien intelligences are again observing the progress of man from Earth. Two UFOs are photographed by an astronaut during a spacewalk. The hatch is open. The astronaut is working his problem. Again, two UFOs flit by. Just moving lights, something that could be easily ignored unless we obtained other pictures and other explanations. Actual pictures which could identify the UFO as a solid object with a mission and under intelligent control. One of the most remarkable instances of UFO photography took place in 1968, here above the Boeing Space Laboratory, south of Renton, Washington. Several photographs were taken of a UFO by then 14-year-old Scott Silty. 
It showed its anti-gravity capabilities as it hovered over the center in two locations. His efforts produced probably the only detailed shots of a UFO materializing to show configuration and portholes. His junior high school instructor, Jim Holm, was given the negatives to develop. Holm said he didn't know what to expect, but became a believer when he saw what the young Silty had apparently captured on film. When they came in that morning and they said, uh, hey, we got the pictures we were talking about, uh, naturally, you know, junior high students, you're a little bit reluctant to believe everything they say. But then, uh, you know, as things proceeded, uh, what happened was I developed the pictures and uh, we know the results now. What is your impression of what that object is? Uh, I'm always hesitant, but uh, uh, I would have to say that believing the students and the type of students they were, uh, it almost definitely had to be some type of a flying object. Right out there. Right. And uh, it's a little eerie. The, the thing that shook me up at first is I was reluctant to believe them. And uh, when I printed the, or developed the film, I really couldn't see that much, but I was shocked. I have to admit, I was shocked when I put it in the enlarger, and through the enlarger I could see a great deal more of what the object looked like. Like and, the portholes. Right. That was, I would say, the portholes was the most shocking part, because then it really, it looked different than just a glow in the sky in a certain form, like you always hear the thing, you know, swamp gas and that sort of thing. But no swamp gas is going to have portholes or a configuration a geometric the way that was. One man who has spent the last 25 years researching and keeping track of UFO sightings in the United States is Seattle fireman Robert Gribble. He has spent his spare time gathering all data possible that will help him keep track of when and where they take place. The pins on this map indicate sightings in the U.S. for just one year. Over the past quarter century, he has come to some conclusions based on the number of sightings he has recorded. We have received and recorded some 30,000 sightings since 1955. Have you noticed any particular patterns that develop in uh, pinpointing the UFO sightings on these maps? No, we have found no marked pattern, although we do believe that they are following two procedures, one a surveillance of the land areas, a very close surveillance, and a close surveillance of the people, and it seems to fluctuate from one to the other. Now, through all these years of research, you must have drawn some conclusions about what they are, what the UFOs are. Well, we firmly believe that uh, what the people are seeing in those objects which we have classified as unknown are actually vehicles uh, not manufactured on this planet. How can you draw that conclusion? How do you know? Well, the vehicles have been seen in the United States, and there are good records of this uh, for the last 200 years, and actually the records go back into history for some 3,000 years. The same thing that were seen then are being seen today. We understand that there are several hot spots in the United States, say UFO sighting areas, and one of them happens to be in the southwestern United States in Utah. There have been uh, a tremendous amount of uh, sightings in the uh, southwest over the years, but with a uh, very large concentration in the uh, Utah area. The Canadian UFO Report was one of the initial UFO publications to headline the story of the possibility that much of the early Mormon history tells of a contact with an alien intelligence, the angel Maroni. It opens the possibility that the founder of Mormonism, their prophet Joseph Smith, may have been one of the greatest of UFO contactees. Dr. Frank B. Salisbury, on the faculty of the State University of Utah in Logan, and himself a Mormon, does not doubt that possibility. He has stated publicly that he believes that his UFO study has established the probability that the Earth is being visited by UFOs that seem to be using the isolated area of eastern Utah as an Earth base. 
In March of 1975, a national tabloid newspaper circulated the following story of a UFO kidnapping. The producers of this motion picture interviewed Carl Higdon, who furnished the artist's conception of the android crewman from the UFO who kidnapped him and took him aboard the UFO to elsewhere. Hagen was given a physical examination in a tower by a huge TV-like eye, rejected, and was returned to the elk hunting area in Wyoming where he was picked up. While on his eight-hour UFO trip, he encountered a teenage boy, two young girls, and a man in his 60s, also guests of the UFO intelligences. Upon his return, he suffered radiation symptoms with itching skin and burning eyes. Area Sheriff Ogburn and his deputy Ed Tierney investigated the incident. So did Dr. Leo Sprinkle of the University of Wyoming, who gives us this professional opinion as to the truth of this verified UFO kidnapping. To whom it may concern, my impression of Carl Higdon is that he's a man of integrity with average education, but a keen sense of curiosity about the world around him. He's an outdoors man and seems to have developed good skills of estimating size and distance. Although the sighting of a single UFO witness often is difficult to evaluate, the indirect evidence supports the tentative conclusion that Carl Higdon is reporting sincerely the events that he experienced. Hopefully, further statements from other persons can be obtained to support the basic statement. Respectfully submitted by R. Leo Sprinkle, Ph.D., the University of Wyoming in Laramie. UFO traffic in the Rocky Mountain area of Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico reached a high level in the November, December, and January period of 1975 and 76 with police departments reporting large cigar-shaped UFOs and other UFO types of spacecraft hovering for days at a time over cities in this area. Five witnesses working in the open country around Snowflake and Holbrook in northeast Arizona had the most incredible personal UFO experience story to tell and passed lie detector tests in their telling of it before police and psychiatrist witnesses. 22-year-old Travis Walton suddenly disappeared one morning as the group was working in the open country. Dwayne Smith, Kenneth Peterson, Alan Dallas, Mike Rogers, and John Goulette were involved in the significant UFO kidnapping incident in which a greenish-blue light originating from a UFO overhead zapped Travis Walton into an invisible dimension from which he returned five days later. His brother tells of the incident. He spent five days on a UFO, uh, he thinks. Now, there is some small time loss in there, but... Uh, for all intent and purposes, he spent five days on there. He did come in contact with some beings that are human-like, but they weren't human. And uh, he had quite an experience. He said he doesn't remember anything about a blue light in the first encounter last Wednesday. The blue light that they saw, he said, uh, at that instant, he got felt like he got hit in the forehead with a baseball bat, and it knocked him out. And he woke up. He was aboard one of the craft. And... Uh, they never spoke to him. They led him around by the hand. They wouldn't, they wouldn't talk to him. They showed him this and that. And uh, when they let him off, he woke up. Did he say they were friendly creatures? Smiled all the time, friendly. Never harmed him. They, don't, he, they were just as nice as they could be. But there was a total lack of communication, either verbal or mental. And he said that's what made him so upset that he couldn't uh, speak with them. Uh, that's what he was very, very disgusted about that. Nervous and uh, just plain disgust. The chance of a lifetime, and they wouldn't cooperate. Obviously, Duane, you know your own brother probably better than anybody else. Uh, do you believe the story? I've never seen him play a practical joke in his adult life. A psychiatrist tells of his examination of Travis. Our conclusion, which is absolute. Uh, is that uh, this young man is not lying, uh, there's no collusion involved, no, no attempt at hoax or collusion with the family or anyone else. Uh, there's a rumor around that there's contracts, there are no such contracts, uh, no motivation for a lie. Any possibility of lying or hoax as you see it? None whatsoever. As we have indicated, UFOs can create a tremendous spatial energy flow. One of the most startling examples of that occurred several years ago on Vashon Island, which is located in the Pacific Northwest in Puget Sound, 
not far from Seattle, Washington. It was near the tiny town of Vashon that several UFO sightings had taken place in the late 1960s. So the fact that local residents had seen such phenomena was not startling. But the fact surrounding one of the incidents was unusual to say the least. So it was out, out in that area? Yeah. On the night of the 19th of February, 1968, Detective Lieutenant Terry Allman was dispatched to an old gravel pit area west of town. Some young people had seen a UFO, and the King County Sheriff's Office was sent to investigate. The temperature was 50 degrees. Allman tells of what he saw. Well, there was a lot of ice. It really had no reason to actually be there. It wasn't that cold. Out. And uh, did it have a certain consistency or something unusual about it? Well, it was an inch and a half thick. It was rather milky and bubble. Mm -hmm. And what, what was the impression that uh, you had, or why did you have the impression that it was some strange phenomenon that created this? Well, I can't be sure about that, except it was entirely too warm out to, to have ice like that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other officers had responded to a UFO call at that same location the night before. The UFO energy flow had apparently left a solid sheet of ice as it supercooled the area below the UFO as it took off. At the freezing temperature of 32 degrees, it would take some 113 hours to freeze the pond 50 feet in diameter with a sheet of ice two inches thick, and the weather had not been that cold. The UFO did it. Because of official concealment, Niles, and just plain ordinary bureaucratic cover-up during the 1950s and 60s, many cases of UFOs establishing themselves as a menace to commercial airlines' safety of flight had been concealed. One night, 10 of 85 passengers aboard an American Airlines commercial flight were injured when their pilot, Captain Ed Bachner, took evasive action to avoid a UFO encounter. It happened to flight number 966 on the night of 17 July 1957 on a flight from El Paso to Dallas, just 50 miles east of El Paso over Salt Flats, Texas. The UFO continued along the Gulf Coast to Gulfport, Mississippi, where it turned north. Traffic control radar tracked the UFO and the military was alerted. In the vicinity of Meridian, Mississippi, the Wing Intelligence RB-47 electronic surveillance airplane tuned in the UFO's emission on its ALA-5 pulse analyzer. As it moved west toward Dallas, Texas, the pulse train of the UFO was analyzed as having a 3,000 megacycle envelope, a duration of two millionths of a second, and a repetition rate of 600 times a second. This was identifiable electromagnetic emission from a UFO, which was also being tracked by military and federal aviation agency radar. The UFO circled Dallas and Fort Worth, Texas, and headed north to Oklahoma City, and continued its track north, followed by the Wing Intelligence electronic surveillance aircraft. This was continued until the U.S. Air Force plane was to run low on fuel near Forbes Air Force Base. At 1.45 on the morning of April 3, 1975, some 20 or more law enforcement officers in five North Carolina counties pursued a bright, glowing, unidentified alien spacecraft. Newspaper headlines told of a major incident which was, in effect, kept secret from the rest of the nation. Newspapers, radio, and television all over the world remained silent on the stories because wire service editors did nothing to emphasize their significance. From police descriptions, the artist has been able to draw the lighted V-shaped UFO which appeared. responsible agency gave to the public any scientifically supported explanation of the origin or mission of the alien space travel device.
The story was much the same two and a half years earlier in Pascagoula, Mississippi. The Pascagoula Press first headlined the story October 12, 1973, and told the nation about two shipyard workers, Calvin Parker and Charles Hickson, who had their fishing trip interrupted by a glowing, blue-lighted UFO which landed near them. Two humanoids took them aboard for a physical examination, placing them under a large TV-like eye. Scientists were quoted as saying that the UFO report was true. NASA was supposed to probe, but didn't. Federal agencies were asked to investigate, but didn't. Hickson said the creatures from the UFO seemed friendly, but that they acted controlled, as if they had a specific thing to do, and did it. They were about five feet high, pale and ghost-like, with crab-like hands and rounded feet. As Hickson and Parker were taken aboard, they suddenly began to float on air, became weightless, and totally helpless. In the Gulf South, from Louisiana to Florida, hundreds of reports to police and sightings by police officers told of UFO activity that same night. No government agency concerned itself with this UFO kidnapping publicly. Luckily, Hickson and Parker were returned. But what of the kidnapped victims of the UFO intelligences who are not returned? Are the UFOs friend or foe? Or are they conducting a project? in which humans become nothing more than guinea pigs. This is serious speculation. Kidnapped victims seem to end up on a missing persons list, and no agency on Earth can locate them. The alien intelligences of the UFO are from somewhere, either in our dimension or from another dimension difficult for anyone to detect. Misunderstanding the complete dominance of man by the UFO intelligences led the city fathers of Ocean Springs on the Gulf Coast to seriously decide to solve the problem by passing a law prohibiting the landing of UFOs in that area. Alderman William F. Dale Jr. thought the local police should be able to handle it. It almost became a law. But the mayor of Ocean Springs, Tom Stennis, broke the tie vote. He said, Let's make them welcome. As yet, no world governmental agency has demonstrated the power either to make UFOs welcome or to combat their landings and possible kidnapping. It's obvious that humans are helpless. Since 1966, the very competent scientific analysts of the British publication, The Flying Saucer Review, have been assembling all available information about alien intelligences who have made repeated UFO landings in the high Pyrenees mountains between France and Spain. So have the defense authorities of both nations. The UMO intelligences claim they come from what we know as Star System Wolf 424, some 14.6 light years from Earth, 90 trillion miles. Near their home planet, their UFO space travel device enters a black hole in space. A giant energy whirlpool vortex 
which hurls their spacecraft into another dimension in which time hardly exists. From this, they emerge into our dimension, into our solar system, and proceed to their expeditionary target, Earth. Later, the UMOs were to tell the European investigators that the universe was at least a ten-dimension unity. Perhaps even more, they were not certain. But they knew of and used at least ten dimensions of reality. Each reality was separate from each of the others. Each of the ten realities had its own rules of energy manipulation. Even though there were ten dimensions which were open to space travel, Reckless energy misuse in one dimension can disturb the cosmic unity of another dimension and its inhabitants. Telepathy is used to receive knowledge during space travel. The mind, said the UMOs in the quiet areas of space, is especially open to pure cosmic knowledge received by telepathy. Any mentality can receive and benefit from knowledge received by telepathy. The more telepathic ability is exercised, the more valuable it becomes, the UMOs learned, as they learned many of the high scientific secrets of the solar systems they traveled through in their space exploration projects. Target Earth was to be another of their cosmic projects. The UMOs first learned of the planet Earth, with inhabitants of some intelligence, in the Earth year 1950. They landed and left eight of their males and females in the area which had high mountains between France and Spain. Since that time, they have studied the new planet and the method of mental understanding used by its inhabitants. They found Earth science could not account for cosmic beings like themselves. They have carefully made themselves known to certain people of France and Spain, about 30 in all. They have tried to understand the limitations which exist in the mind of man. They find human knowledge inadequate and much inferior to the cosmic understanding, which permits space voyages between the UMO position in the universe and the Earth. Jupiter looks to the Earth-developed eye like this, to the UMO, perhaps different. Jupiter's moon Ganymede is some 8,000 miles away and moves in its orbit, its diameter 3,000 miles. The UMO intelligences took a heat measurement of the Jupiter hotspot. They compared the measurements to that of the surface of their sun and found it about the same. The other Jupiter moons were identified, Europa, Amalfia, Callisto as they were named by Earth astronomers. This terrifying information to come out so that there'll be people in a camp of, uh, you know, oh, there are good ones and there are bad ones and we're going to choose sides, and it's Star Wars all over again. I mean, this is like, uh, uh, you know, a wet dream, I hate to say that, for the intelligence community to have people, uh, you know, brainwashed this way. And I, you know, what I think that, you know, when I met years ago, I got a document, um, it's in the film very briefly, Sirius, which you can see at our website, S-I-R-I-U-S is the name of the film, and, and it came out last year as the biggest crowdfunded film in history. And what happened is, in this document, it was, although they didn't spend much time on it in the movie, I would have liked to spend more time, is that it was from the Strategic Studies Institute, and it was talking, this is 1996, about creating a global abduction cult and to simulate human uh, being abducted by aliens that would be done with very advanced aircraft and the stagecraft of creatures that look like aliens but aren't. And, you know, this document is in black and white. It's an authentic document describing this program. Now, you know, if, if that's all there was, I'd say, well, you know, that's interesting. But then I've met with so many 
the men and women who've been in these projects. Um, I remember talking to a man who uh, had been in a program back in the 70s, uh, it was the late 60s and 70s, where they were doing this. And he says, oh, yeah, back then we didn't have as good a stagecraft, as they called it, as we do now. But we were able to get these anti-gravity devices and have people appear to be aliens. And they would use various chemical substances, electromagnetic weapons, and they would engage in various types of abductions and also mutilation events back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and for livestock. And he said, we were doing that because we knew that that would make its way into the tabloid media and the UFO subculture and begin to start this, this slowly snowballing effect of fearing everything alien. So that's sort of how the game is played. It's been played for thousands of years by despotic uh, demagogues, whether they be religious figures or political figures. Uh, and there's always an agenda behind it. The agenda behind it is to manipulate people through fear. And I think that, you know, one of the big challenges of this era right now is for people to transcend and see through that. And it's like the old Who song, we won't be fooled again. And I, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of people have been fooled. Uh, and the idea that these um, programs aren't very well funded and extremely sophisticated in the technologies they have, uh, you know, it's just a wrong idea. They are well funded albeit illegally, and they are very sophisticated in the technologies they have and also in the ability they have to stage something and fool people. So I think you have to view so much of this with, a, with an eye of, uh, it's sort of like, is it real or Memorex, you know, the old commercial years ago about the audio tapes? You know, is it actually an ET event or is it something masquerading as ET or alien for the purpose of psychological warfare, like the Benowitz case? Uh, that everyone probably knows about the Air Force Office's special investigations case back in um, uh, the day in, in the uh, near Sandia National Laboratories in Kirkland Air Force Base, uh, where you know they really did stage not only a human abduction but a whole series of things and documents to um, put people off the course. Now, what a lot of people don't know is what they were really trying to hide, aside from putting out the false information, is that there was a woman that uh, Paul Benowitz knew that had actually seen near Kirkland and Sandia a man-made anti-gravity propulsion device that looks like a UFO. And in order to sort of brainwash her into thinking that was not ours but alien, they set up this whole series of things that Richard Doty and others were involved in. And I think that this is a real problem because, you know, uh, it, you know, you can't take things at face value, and when you do, you're going to find that you're just being played by some very sophisticated people who have a lot of experience manipulating mass markets and mass media and subcultures into a certain type of reactive or reactionary perspective. And, and I'd say, well, you know, you can never prove a negative, so you can never prove that there are no civilizations out there that may not have our best interest in, at heart. But let's say even if that were true, what's your response going to be? Is your response going to be more war, i.e. Star Wars, interplanetary systems that are going into war? Well, if you understand technologies that are these scalar electromagnetic weapon systems, you can take out an entire planet with a system like that. So if, not a, if, if hydrogen bombs and atomic bombs would leave the world uninhabitable, these systems are even worse than that. So there is only one path forward, and it's peace. And it's not as exciting as a horror film about aliens. It's not as titillating about finding a new group of people. You know, you can't overtly be a racist, and you can't overtly uh, hate women, or you can't. Now they're wanting to find a way that people can overtly hate something. Well, what's the next something? Well, it's another system out there, another star system that we have to hate. It's a very convenient thing. It's tragic, but it plays into this sort of collective experience of humanity in our recorded history of ethnic groups, religious groups, political groups going to battle, going to war. And you look at the last hundred years, you know, we've killed something like 200 million of our own species in warfare on this planet, um, and often for things that are just ridiculous. Um, and yet that is, that's something that is un unfortunately one of the chief organizing principles of the current world order is an us versus them military, industrial, centralized governmental complex. 
And if they really want to be able to take that to the next level, they've got to find another enemy. So this is, this is I think, what's really deeply behind so much of the information that tends to scare people and, and turn people into these sort of dualistic camps of us versus them. Now, Dr. Greer, we are an extremely primitive species with this tribal warfare. Like you just said, these 200 million people that were killed. And obviously the next step in, in, in evolution is – People need to realize that you know we are the same because there's others out there. And isn't there some sort of federation, galactic federation out there that's awaiting us for to ask them, or or is it are they waiting for us Absolutely. to have peace? Absolutely, there is. I mean, there 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 is a, a very large network of interstellar civilizations that have been observing our development for a very very long time. Now, my view on this, looking at you know, stepping back and looking at the last, say, 100,000 years, most of which isn't recorded, it's been a process of humans going from tribes to you know, city-states, you know, the, the, you know, Greece and the Trojans, and then going to nations and nation-building, and now to something resembling of an interconnected global society, although highly dysfunctional. And then the next step, obviously, would be to become inter-global, interplanetary. However, that ticket, to get to that next stage, the requirement is that you have become at least nominally civilized so that you're not murdering each other by the millions. We haven't made that leap yet. So unfortunately, our technology has advanced enormously, you know, from, you know, muskets and cannons and things of this sort in the 1800s and 1700s to a thermonuclear weapons and things that are classified weapons that are even more fearsome, as well as technologies that are very, very advanced. So we have developed technologies ahead of our social and spiritual development, and that is exactly the window. That's exactly the period when a species such as ours is at greatest risk, not only to ourselves, but I know I sound like a, a doctor here, but not only dangerous to ourselves, but dangerous to others. Now, interestingly, if someone comes into my emergency department, I'm an emergency doctor by training, who's a danger to himself or others, they get committed to, to a mental facility. And, you know, I had a friend who was a Harvard psychologist. He was hilarious, and he had had an encounter outside Washington that was amazing. And he said to me, he says, yes, well, the Earth right now is the intergalactic insane asylum because we're all we're acting completely like a bunch of crazy people. And I said, yeah, I know. So, you know, the, one of the things is we have to become nominally sane. And it's not that we're going to all become perfect or enlightened. I'm not, and I doubt anyone listening is. However, we can at least stop murdering each other by the millions and setting up these systems that uh, are designed to manipulate people into larger and larger and more and more expensive battles. And I think that's something that can only be changed by the people because there's so much power uh, that is centered at the top of this uh, food chain uh, of exactly what Eisenhower warned us about, the military-industrial complex, which is now the military-industrial financial laboratory uh, you know, research complex. And at the deepest levels of it are folks who really do want to be able to maintain control over not just American or British population, but a global population by presenting an existential threat that is not human. And I think that drives so much of the agenda of the false information, the concocted cases, the stagecraft. Now, have there been people who have been horrible victims of this? Yes. And you know, a lot of people, when they've heard me say this, say, well, you're not very sympathetic to people who've been injured or abducted. I said, no, I'm very sympathetic. Where I differ is, is the conclusion of who's doing it and what's behind it. Uh, there was a physicist who used to work out at um, Pine Gap, uh, the facility near Alice Springs in the center of the continent of Australia, and um, brilliant man. And he was talking to me about how they had been manufacturing for years these creatures that look like aliens, but they're actually man-made kind of bio nanotechnology creatures that have been used in abductions and have really been very persuasive um, for a lot of people thinking that uh, that they had an encounter with an, an alien when it was actually something that people were making that was some excellent excellent 
stagecraft. I say excellent in the sense of very well done, but diabolical and, and absolutely evil. And, and so I think that, you know, until you get a, you know, do a really good research on this and, and begin to drill down that, you know, since the 80s, there have been people who have concluded that, uh, you know, it's not just MK Ultra at the CIA that was doing experiments on people. There are all kinds of experiments that have been done with some technologies that most people wouldn't believe humans have. But it's because they're assuming that the technologies they know about, such as might be at MIT or Caltech or Oxford or Cambridge, that that's the state of the art. It is not the state of the art. The state of the art of the technologies are unpublished in deep black projects that are in these underground facilities near Edwards and the Nellis Range, what people call Area 51, but you know, nobody in the business calls it that. But And these technologies that are in the hands of the big corporate titans, such as Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman, and SAIC and E-Systems and Raytheon and on and on and on. Those technologies are highly classified and are, you know, most people, if they were to see them displayed, would say, oh, that's got to be alien. Well, it's not. It's just that they don't know how far these technologies over the last 50 years uh, of studying, not just science in general, but also recovered and downed ET craft, have advanced, and they are substantial. So this substantial growth in technology that's classified uh, and is not known by the general public would almost certainly fool anyone who would see it. I remember back in the early 90s, it was after I briefed the CIA director for Bill Clinton, I had a man pull me aside. He said, you know, we have technologies that are so good that if we want to have somebody have a conversation with their personal God, a Jesus, a Buddha, whoever, They'll have it, they will think it's real, and they will pass a lie detector test that it happened to them. He looked at me square in the eye. This guy, I mean, it was chilling. And I said, what are you talking about? At that time, I thought this has got to be nonsense. And he went through a lot of this, and I went, oh, my God. I mean, you know, and this is why, you know, research on this issue is not simple. It's like... Um, it's like an a onion you pull back, and you, 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 know, you pull back 38 layers, and you think you've reached the core of it, and you've got 50 more to pull back. So it, it's a, not a simple issue. Let me ask you this, Dr. Greer. You're saying that the technology is so superior right now that they can mimic an alien abduction, mimic uh, UFO flights and anti-gravity and this. But when you're doing your summoning events and having your, your CE-5, could this be possible again, technology that might be man-made and you might be, uh, you know, being deceived again? Oh, absolutely. We have that. We've had both happen on the same week-long training event. Um, but by the way, I just want to mention to people, there are two spots still available for the week after the Joshua Tree event. You know, we're going to do the thing that Sunday night's open to the public. Then we're going to do a small team training for an entire week up in Joshua Tree that begins that night and goes for an entire week to the following Sunday morning. Um, and that's limited, I think, about 25 people. But there are two p spots left, so if anyone has that week and wants to do it, they can go to SeriousDisclosure.com and find out. But we have had that happen. I'll give you a great example. One time we were up in a, um, a lot you probably know where Sedona, Arizona is, and we were up in that area, and we had an amazing sighting and contact with actual ET craft and these translucent beings that were around us, very ET. The craft were seamless, this and that. And then later, we had a disc fly over, but it had two jet fighters escorting it that was 100% man-made. It was a man-made anti-grav um, that was going from the south to the north. I suspect it was headed up towards... Um, the, the Provo area, the Dugway Proving Grounds, which is an underground area there south of Provo that's this, one of the state-of-the-art facilities now in America. Um, most people don't know about They always think of Area 51. I say, yeah, that was a cool place in the 60s and 70s. But um, so <laughs> this, this event, everyone there, there are like 30, 40 people there looked up and they said, what the hell is this? I said, well, that's one of ours. So, yeah, I, I think people have to have enough knowledge, and I think this is one of the things that we, I try to train people when I do these um, expeditions with them, is, is to say, look, here's the, the characteristics of an actual interstellar, transdimensional uh, extraterrestrial vehicle and these beings. Here's what 
we have that I know about that are classified projects, there there are distincting distinguishing characteristics. Now, if it's too far away and there's not enough information, you have to say, well, gee, I don't know if that was one of ours or one of theirs. Um, um, and I think that, but if you don't even have that, you know, in medicine we talk about differential diagnosis so that if somebody has chest pain, you know, there are like 115 things that that can be. One of them is a heart attack. But if you don't know about a, the other 114 other things, you're going to miss a dissecting thoracic aneurysm, which is, of course, what killed Princess Diana. So you have got to have enough knowledge and information. What I find is uh, sort of a difficult in the UFO subculture is that it, people aren't drilling down at the depth that they need to because the people studying new energy and anti-gravity and secret aircraft uh, programs don't give much. Some of them don't even think any of it's ET. A lot of the people involved with the ET and so-called alien issue don't know about the other. You really have to put all of it together in a comprehensive bit of information. And this is what I've been trying to bring forward. Uh, it, it's difficult because people want simplistic answers, but um, it ain't simple. If it were simple, this problem would have been solved before I was born in the 50s. So I think that's why we as a people have to begin to say, this has got to be childhood zen now. We have to have a mature understanding of this issue, uh, but not only in terms of how interstellar civilizations might appear in our time and space and how we might make contact with them, but what are the capabilities within the deep black programs at the Lockheed Skunk Works inside the, what's called the cube, the big underground cube area uh, near Edwards Air Force Base. What are the capabilities within, um, you know, uh, out at Pine Gap in Australia? What are the capabilities that are electromagnetic weapon systems or systems that could simulate an event? You have to know all of this in order to actually go out there and understand what's happening. And if you don't have that comprehensive amount of information, uh, you're really, it's like a blind, blind man holding on to an elephant, you know, and you may be holding on to the back end of it. You know, you, you mean, so I think it's, it's, it's a complicated issue. It's not insurmountable, but one can't take a facile, um, and it's not a trivial issue to, to get all this information around into a comprehensive paradigm. And that's what I didn't know 24 years ago when I started the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and the Worldwide Disclosure Movement. I, I knew about some of this, but between 1990 and, and, the, and the year 1998 or so, I went through a very steep learning curve uh, from people who were on the inside of these projects. I mean, as you know, I have an uncle who was Northrop Grumman and worked on the lunar module, the thing that put the first man on the moon. So I had a lot of contact when I began to learn what our capabilities were that were classified that are 100% human. I went, oh my God, this is a really complex issue. It's not as simple as people think. So when I know we, Dr. J and we have some guests on the line that want to get some questions into you, Dr. Greer, like Johnny Webb, all the way from the UK, but I wanted to get this in. Uh, the false flag event. Is it on or off the table by the powers that may be a major invasion, CNN post it, and then there it is. Everybody knows that. Here, here's the extraterrestrial. We know we're not alone. Is this on the table, off the table? And, and how are you going to know if it's not, uh, it's not legitimate, if it's one of ours or if it's the real deal? Well, first of all, the interstellar civilizations have no need to invade here. I mean, I think... With all due respect to Zachariah Sitchin and others, no civilization needs to come here to get anything we have here. We don't need to be turned into slaves digging up gold. If you understand the technologies of interstellar travel, you can materialize any element, any material you want through resonant field frequencies. And I can get into this later if you want to talk about it. Um, so this is not something that, you know, there's no real reason to come here. Uh, and by the way, they estimate there are 11 billion Earth-like planets in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, which is one of billions of galaxies. So anything that's here on this planet is abundant throughout the universe. So there's no need, if you can travel from one star system in one point in space-time to another by going beyond the speed of light through these other dimensions, 
there's no reason that there'd be that kind of an event that would be for their own self-interest, number one. Number two, the, the, what you ask about this false flag event, what people haven't understood about what I'm talking about is that that event has been going on for 50 years. In other words, since Eisenhower lost control of these covert projects in the 50s, they have been putting out disinformation that has been tailored to create within the Hollywood, science fiction, and UFO subcultures this sort of aura of fear and of alien evasion and fearing all things alien. And I think this is uh, something that people don't understand. It's a long-term project. What so Werner von Braun, when he was talking about this, uh, he was talking about it you know, in 1974. That was 40 years ago. So it isn't like this is something that's just like a singular event that's going to happen. It's an ongoing disinformation and counterintelligence project that all of us have been victims of. That's are they going to get it on two. a world scale, though, like CNN all at once? Is that on the table? Or they, that, that, sure. That's they're not... something that, that I would say that's something that's possible in the future, uh, and I think people would have to be very, very careful about how they evaluate what's going on. I mean, you know, I wish we had been so ca- careful about the claims about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq before we went up and, and, dan- and completely dissembled that country. And look what we have now, probably what's going to become the biggest uh, terrorist and radical state in the entire world, much worse than Afghanistan. So I think that what people have to begin to do is they need to question this. And if it's on CNN or any other major network, you really need to question it, I hate to say it, because, you know, those guys uh, are often just basically uh, taking dictation from the right hand of the king. And I'm quoting, you know, that what I just said, taking dictation from the right hand of the king, is what a very good friend of Mike Wallace at 60 Minutes told me up in New York back in the 90s, a guy named Schwartz. And uh, Schwartz, this guy told me, he said, look, he says, I used to think we had a free press. He says, you know, and he, he had been dealing with Mike Wallace on some of this stuff, dealing with these majestic documents and other things way back in the 80s and 90s. He says, what I found is that basically the big media cannot cover and will only portray things that they are ordered to do because they're corporatized. And those big media corporations are vertically and horizontally integrated into the system. So, you know, I think that, uh, something certainly could be done like that. Now, the other th- issue is that you can have an authentic ET event, and it could be spun into something that is an invasion. For example, I'll give you a great example. Um, back during the darkest days of the Cold War, as you know from the Disclosure Project witnesses, that many of our intercontinental ballistic missile, our nuclear missile silos, and facilities were overflown by ET craft. A number of cases where, like in Minot, North Dakota, uh, where you had 16 to 20 intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, thermonuclear weapons, that were rendered unlaunchable all at the same time. Now, at the same time that, the same era when that was happening, Sam, I remember talking to Sam Donaldson of ABC News about this, that, that was going on in the Soviet Union with their nuclear weapons, but in a different way. And basically, what one of the, a captain who was there in the Air Force at Minot, North Dakota, said he really felt that the ETs were saying, don't blow up this beautiful planet. But if you do launch, know this, we can intervene so you don't destroy all life on Earth because this Earth is precious. He really got that vibe. And I said, well, of course that's what they were saying. If they wanted to come in and just invade and sanitize the whole Earth of all this stuff, They could do that probably in a couple of nanoseconds. The problem is that would look like an invasion. So it's sort of a catch-22. They're waiting for us to fix this problem because if it's done from outside, number one, we're not going to learn any lessons and evolve. And number two, it will be portrayed by these special interests as an invasion when it isn't, when they're simply trying to help or prevent something disastrous. So I think we have to look at this in a much wiser way than the sort of the, I don't know, the paranoiac and sensationalism uh, that, that permeates this issue right now. And, and that's one of the more difficult things for people to accept because to be thoughtful about this is, is really difficult and to be reactionary is predictable, but cliché. Dr. Greer, we got 